Well, anyway, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this uh, second part of the sixth uh, OECD uh, competition open day. Uh, I'm Antonio Capobianco from the OECD competition uh, division and I have the pleasure and of course the honor uh, to moderate this first um, session in the, the afternoon. We'll be discussing uh, algorithmic competition. Uh, now, before I introduce you, uh, the, our panelists, um, we agreed that I would uh, give a little introduction to the topic, basically put a few dots uh, on paper for you, and I'm sure the panelists will help us connect those dots in the next uh, hour, hour and 15 uh, uh, minutes. Um, if we can put up the slides, I think the first question that uh, um, we had is, what is an algorithm? And um, what you see here on screen is the definition of algorithms that we have used in our work here at the OECD. It's uh, basically an algorithm is a, essentially a sequence of operation that transforms uh, an input into an output. So as you can see, it's quite a broad uh, definition. You can cover uh, many phenomena, even a, a recipe, how to transform ingredients into a meal or a music sheet, go from seven notes to the Furelisa of Beethoven is in a way an algorithm. So of course I'm sure our panelists would love to talk about food and music in the next hour and 15 minutes, but actually what we are in mind here is developments that have been sort of brought about by uh, digitalization and the digital economy. So we're thinking about search algorithms, pricing algorithms, and AI-empowered uh, algorithms. Now, algorithms are not uh, a new concept. Uh, I went on Wikipedia, and I think the word goes back to the ninth century. There is an, uh, an Arab mathematicians, mathematician that uh, oh, um, uh, developed the concept. Uh, uh, but some of these algorithms, if, even the new ones that we're going to discuss today, are not so recent. And uh, they were developed even you know, decades ago, pricing algorithms. So they were developed in a theoretical world. Why? Because there was not enough data and computer power to transform those ideas or the theoretical models into concrete application. Things have changed, of course, uh, and so we live uh, uh, in, a day, in, a, in, a, in a time where we are surra uh, surra uh, surrounded by uh, algorithms that are very pervasive in our life. They are very widely used by businesses, by consumers, by all of us, uh, and not only in the uh, online uh, world. Um, now, algorithms can be classified also by type of technology, so we wanted to give a bit of a few couple of definitions, uh, and they're mostly based on AI, so artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and deep learning. Now, artificial intelligence is the overarching uh, system. Uh, machine learning is a subset of AI, of artificial intelligence, and deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. So these are concentric circles very much uh, connected to each other. So artificial intelligence uh, is the broadest of these uh, three terms. Uh, it's used to classify machines that mimic uh, human intelligence and human cognitive functions like problem solving, solving and learning. Uh, the difference between machine learning and deep learning rests in the ability to process raw data. Now the distinction is not so uh, dichotomic, of course. Uh, machine learning requires manual features engineering, while I think deep learning Features engineering is more automatic in a way than, uh, than machine uh, learning. Um, now, in terms of um, uh, use uh, and function of algorithms, I've tried to just put down on this slide, I hope you can read it, uh, different um, uh, purposes that uh, alg algorithms can um, perform. And I don't need to explain all of this because you, know, you recognize a lot of these uh, concept in your, from, from your daily experience uh, in um, uh, using algorithms. Uh, some of the more relevant ones that have come across the work of competition authorities, and maybe we'll come back to in the discussion today, are search algorithms, recommendation, allocation, monitoring, and pricing algorithms. Now, search algorithms, uh, think about your favorite search engine, basically presents and orders information based on inputs that you give to the, to the algorithms. Recommendation algorithms uh, recommend information or product mostly based on behavioral data that the algorithm has about the user. So it basically recommends certain um, uh, products. Think about your you know, main um, sort of music uh, st streaming service or film or video or streaming service. When you log in, you get a suggestion, a so recommendation automatically from the platform. 
Now, allocation algorithms, uh, basically, they, you have to think about, many of you have surely taken a cab this morning, and so these algorithms meet a demand and the supply, whether it's a taxi or an Uber car, so basically they automate the execution of transactions. Now, some of the algorithms that will probably be more prominent in the discussion today are monitoring algorithms, which firms use to monitor what their competitors do in terms of pricing or strategic decisions, and pricing algorithms, of course. Pricing algorithms help setting or recommend prices using data on observable customer characteristics or the market condition, demand and supply on a particular market. Um, now, as I said, these algorithms, algorithms are very pervasive in today's, in our lives today. I mean, I didn't, couldn't find uh, data to show how you know, diffuse they are in, in our day, but I think if, you know, I found, we found something on pricing algorithms, and if you are interested in uh, understanding how much uh, this, uh, spread they are today, you can take a look at the background paper that we produced last year. I think there are copies in the back of the room, or uh, you can download it online. We focus mostly on pricing uh, algorithms. Um, now, clearly, businesses use, um, that offer digital service strongly rely on algorithms, uh, and we are all aware of that. But even in the offline economy, if I can call it like that, businesses extensively rely on algorithms for marketing purposes, to determine the best way to target or to reach consumers, sales promotions, and of course, to optimize, optimize the use of resources and manufacturing processes. Now, we'll talk probably less, but uh, I'm sure uh, Michal will not resist the reference to consumer use of algorithms. If it's uh, true that human cannot beat algorithms, maybe you need an algorithm to beat an algorithm. Uh, but consumers do, of course, rely <clears throat> on algorithms extensively. And that's also governments. Yesterday, we had a very interesting uh, seminar with competition authorities where Ryan uh, was there and that you know, looks at how government can use algorithms to detect crimes, of course, uh, antitrust infringements. Uh, or uh, uh, other ways of enforcing more effectively the competition law or other laws. Now, I don't have to explain to you the benefits of algorithms. Uh, we experience them every day, as I said, you know, every time we play with our smartphone looking for a restaurant or checking the weather or, you know, searching for the latest news on what was soccer or football, whatever is your favorite sports. Uh, that's, uh, it's not the person behind the screen that tells you or gives you an answer. There is, of course, uh, an algorithm. But the marvels of algorithms go beyond the commercial uses. So you think about the discovery in medical fields, uh, developing new uh, uh, antibiotics, uh, uh, or crop monitoring, yield prediction in, the, in agriculture, self-driven cars in uh, automotive industries, uh, prediction of large disasters like earthquakes, uh, climate modeling. I'm sure if one day we'll, put, uh, we'll, we'll go to Mars, so an algorithm or an AI algorithm will fly us to, uh, to Mars. Now, how does benefits translate in the discussion about competition policy? And a lot of that, you've heard the words, uh, the key words in the previous panels. It's innovation, it's efficiency, it's choice, new products and services, lower costs, ultimately consumer welfare. So all of that is what we want to see from uh, competitive uh, markets. Uh, but the question that has echoed uh, in these rooms um, for several years now is how government can ensure that these benefits uh, from technological advancements uh, are reach consumers without consumers suffering from consequences in terms of higher prices, increased market power. Uh, the discussion started with the risk of collusion, algorithm, algorithms supporting or making explicit collusion more easy, but then moved also to tacit collusion. Are we living in a world where tacit collusion might become more common, even in markets that were not considered, where, where, where it was, tacit collusion were not considered possible uh, before? So these are some of the questions that I've uh, sort of put to the panelists, um, uh, and I will discuss in the next, uh, 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 in the next hour or so. So can algorithms enhance firms' performances? Can they harm consumers? Can they help fix prices or exclude competitors? Uh, uh, so if that's the case, what can governments, competition authorities, or regulators do to mitigate this risk? And what about AI? So are we moved in a different world, or is the same world with similar problems, or is a new world with different problems? Now, to tackle uh, some of these questions, at least, we are really privileged to have three uh, experts with us. Uh, I'll introduce them now. So Michal Gal on my left. Uh, Michal is professor and director of the Forum on Law and Markets at the Faculty of Law in Haifa. Uh, next to her, you have Martin Peter Schinkel. Martin Peter 
He's a professor of economics at the University of Amsterdam, Department of Economics and Business, and he's a research fellow at the Timbergen Institute. Uh, those of you who have sort of uh, read about uh, algorithmic competition over the years, um, surely have come across their work. They spend a lot of uh, their research time on dealing with these issues. And last but certainly not least, uh, on the far left, uh, Ryan Tanzi. He represents here the enforcement uh, world. He's um, chief of the antitrust division's Washington criminal section one at the US Department of Justice and has been involved in a number of cases uh, directly, directly connected with uh, algorithmic uh, um, competition. Now there is a fourth voice that we'd like to uh, uh, hear from and that's, that's you. Uh, we'd like to hear what you think about the issue and we've done this in two ways. Uh, first is to um, um, use poll uh, function, and we'll do that twice. Uh, so you see already the first question on screen for you. So we'd like to have your views on if, whether you think that the increasing use of algorithms is a problem. Uh, does it pose risk for competition? As you can see, the answer can be polarized, a yes and a no answer, but also an intermediate answer where um, risk may exist by the pro-competitive and efficiency enhancing effect of algorithms outweigh the risks. So please let us know what you think. At the end of the panel, we'll show the results uh, and we'll have to see what our panelists think about your, uh, your, your views. Uh, there'll be also time for Q&A at the end, so we'll give you the floor uh, for a couple of questions uh, if there is time at the end. Now, while you answer this first question, you can scan the QR code and it will point you to a platform where you can choose your answer. I'll turn to the, to the panelists and I'll come and sit next to you in a, in a moment. Uh, maybe starting with Michal. Uh, Michal has done a lot of work on what are the general principles on how to treat algorithmic competition. We moved a bit away from the risk of collusion to other risks with algorithms. Maybe Michal can tell a little bit about that and what are the main takeaways for competition policy. Michal. <coughs> Thank you very much. It's such a pr privilege and an honor to be here. Um, I actually participated in the first discussion about algorithmic um, competition in 2017 about coordination. And ever since, uh, this field has been um, very much alive. A lot of research has been done in the area. And what I'll try to do is give you um, just a flavor of some of the things that uh, are happening in this world. So first of all, I, I, um, I think that um, um, there is um, a real change going on. There is a, a game-changing switch to semi-automated uh, decision-making in many firms with regard to many tasks. And this, of course, brings with it a lot of um, benefits, such as speed and precision and automation and uh, sophistication and cost saving, which uh, often might translate into lower entry barriers into some markets. Just think about a firm that needs to determine where to locate its um, warehouses optimally, and it uses data-based algorithms to do so, creates more efficiency, can compete better with other firms. Um, but at the same time, as Antonio has so rightly said, um, algorithms can create um, and, and can increase some anti-competitive concerns. And while most of the debate up to date uh, focused on algorithmic coordination, I would like to focus on unilateral conduct, on how algorithms affect uh, uh, abuse um, of dominance. And then I will provide a few uh, basic principles that I believe carry over to many of these cases. So um, um, let me start. I mean, the first point I would like to make, and this is a point that a lot of competition authorities around the world have already recognized, is that algorithms can increase market power. Um, they can, of course, lower it in some instances, but they can increase it. Think just, you know, just a very simple example that we all know. Think about Google's search algorithm, which has become much better than other search algorithms. It was dominant for many years up until, you know, just a year ago when we have the generative AI, chat GPT models, and um, that uh, start competing. And by the way, BARD is owned by Google. Um, but more commonly overlooked is the fact that algorithms can create more opportunities for firms to abuse their dominance once they have such dominance. And um, so the use of algorithms can either uh, increase the occurrence 
of uh, abuse or the harm from many types of anti-competitive conduct, including tying and predation and discrimination and excessive pricing, just to name um, a few. And um, so let me give you uh, several examples. One of the things that algorithms based on um, uh, and a lot of data can do better today is to determine the willingness to pay, to calculate the willingness to pay of consumers. Um, if you give the algorithm enough data, um, uh, the calculations uh, may better predict how a consumer is likely to react to a change in price and uh, to differentiate between different uh, um, classes of consumers. So these predictive algorithms um, offer sophistication to better analyze the effects of current and foreseeable market uh, um, conditions on the willingness of pay, uh, to pay of consumers. Now, let's see how it plays in practice. One thing is, of course, predation. So um, for many years, uh, our assumptions were that predation uh, almost never takes place. And if it does, then it's, uh, the, the, the rules that we have um, make it very difficult to prove predation. Now, introduce algorithms. What algorithms do is they um, increase the ability of firms to determine which consumers are likely to switch um, uh, when um, higher prices are introduced or when lower prices, um, uh, when another firm uh, introduces a, a lower price. And then you have to target only them. Now, if you do that, you, can, uh, you don't need to spend so much money on a predatory scheme. And some of the economic assumptions that were made in the past with regard to the efficiency of, pred of predation uh, fall apart. And you might think that this is a theoretical um, uh, point, but let me give you an example. That example comes from a firm that we all know, Uber. Uh, Uber, is, uh, Uber competes with Lyft over drivers, okay? It wants the drivers to work with it because of network effects. Now, what do you do? How do you create a pricing scheme such that the drivers would prefer to operate with you rather than Lyft? and reduce the price. What they did is they created an algorithm which they termed hell. That was the name that they gave it. And what that algorithm did is it calculated, it used data about uh, drivers switching and when drivers tended to switch and which drivers tended to switch in order to then uh, um, make better offers to only these drivers and not to every driver. So you can already see that what you do is you need to target only some of the drivers, not everybody, okay? And so you reduce the price of this supra-competitive selective pricing, which is, you know, uh, the, um, a, a lot like uh, predation. Another thing that algorithms, algorithms affect is, for example, price discrimination. And for exactly the same reason that I gave before, that algorithms can better calculate willingness to pay. Now, if you know a lot about consumers, if you have a better digital profile of a consumer, you can then know better how much the consumer is willing to pay for a certain product, maybe differently than others, so that the possibility of discrimination might be higher, and especially algorithms operating on platforms where each consumer sees a different price and it doesn't even necessarily know what the prices of others are seeing at the same place, so he doesn't even recognize that he's being discriminated against, okay? So these are just two examples of how algorithms can affect abuse. Um, and let me now, because um, um, there's so much, <laughs> again, uh, there's a lot to say in this area, but um, I would like to, uh, um, you know, finish this part of the discussion by offering you several principles that I think carry over all cases uh, regarding competition with algorithms. Um, so one is that algorithms do not prevent the application of competition law. The fact that the firm is using an algorithm to perform a certain task 
does not mean that competition law does not apply. Second, if a certain kind of conduct would, would have been prohibited if engaged in by a human, it should be prohibited if it's engaged in by an algorithm and maybe the um, opposite is also true. Third, there's always a human in the loop, okay? Somebody created the algorithm at some time, okay? And somebody is using the algorithm and somebody chose the algorithm, okay? So even when we think about algorithms, there are humans in the loop somewhere. Fourth is that algorithms do not necessarily, they do not change the economic principles. For example, a market, the way that we define market would not change just because we're using algorithms. However, what they do is they change the assumptions at the basis of some of our laws, and I'm gonna talk about this uh, a bit later. Another principle is that algorithms often create mixed effects, and that's what makes enforcement so difficult. Take even um, pricing algorithms that might, under some conditions, create collusion, okay, or coordination. I should be careful with the, uh, with the uh, definitions. They create algorithmic coordination. But the same pricing algorithm also saves a lot of costs. It also saves the cost of monitoring, of setting the price, okay? So a lot of algorithms have, you know, um, um, uh, different effects. By the use of the same algorithm, con uh, competition authorities must balance. And finally, two, uh, uh, two, the final two principles that I would like to suggest is that when analyzing a case using an algorithm, it's really important to think about the whole ecosystem. So you think about the, the data which is available. You should think about the infrastructure, okay? You should think about all the parts in the data ecosystem. And finally, as Antonio has so rightly said, when we think about algorithms and we uh, analyze um, the incentives of firms to use certain kinds in an, or in a certain way, we should think about the three different parties which can use algorithms. And these are not only suppliers, which we usually focus on, but also consumers that can use algorithms, and we can talk about it later, and also governments to, for detection, illuminations of solutions for predictions, and they change the dynamics in the market. Uh, thank you, Michal. Maybe, uh, Ryan, you've heard a uh, number of takeaways uh, for competition policy from you know, the use of algorithms that does reflect the experience of you know, a large agency, a large enforcers like the US Department of Justice. I'm sure you can tell us uh, a few examples without disclosing you know, or discussing pending cases, but maybe a few takeaways also for businesses. There are a lot of businesses in the room that would like to hear what advice would a large agency give them on, uh, on this, in this area? Yeah, so I, I, again, I obviously can't talk about specific cases, but I think you know, high level concepts. I have to start by saying that I, I'm appearing today in my personal capacity and that the views I express are not necessarily the views of the Department of Justice. Um, so I think you know, I'd start off by saying that um, you know, under our laws in the United States, uh, horizontal agreements among competitors regarding prices or market allocation are per se illegal and they're subject to felony prosecution. And that prohibition includes not only um, express agreements among competitors, but it includes, again, what you were talking about before, tacit agreements where uh, there may be an invitation by a firm for competitors to agree horizontally and uh, that, that invitation inherently contemplates concerted action. Um, and so we see this with algorithm. This is always going to depend on the facts um, and the intent of the parties. However, as technological change proliferates um, and firms start to use algorithms and AI to set prices more, um, we expect to see that concerted action or the nature of concerted action uh, among firms will also change and take more varied, sophisticated forms, including um, you know, the use of uh, tacit agreements, essentially, to fix prices. Um, you know, just one example, um, there's a quote from a 2016 case involving allegations that Uber, um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, used a pricing algorithm in setting uh, uh, fares that it charged to riders. In the case is uh, Meyer v. Uh, Kalanick. And I think this quote really, uh, really kind of highlights a lot of the, the points, at least under our law, which is the Sherman Act. Uh, and the quote is, uh, a Sherman Act conspiracy is but one form of conspiracy, a concept that is as ancient as it is broad. It is fundamental to the law of conspiracy that the agreements that form the essence of the misconduct are not just to be judged by the technical niceties, but by practical realities. Uh, sophisticated conspirators often reach their agreements as much by the wink and a nod as by explicit agreement. And the implicit agreement may be far more potent and sinister just by virtue of it being implicit. So, you know, getting specifically to AI and algorithms, uh, our view is that these technologies, they make it far more, um, far easier for companies and competitors to utilize competitively sensitive information, uh, potentially anti-competitively. Um, there were some safe harbors that DOJ had uh, a couple of years ago uh, regarding use of historical pricing data in certain markets that the, uh, the department essentially withdrew because of this perceived risk that algorithms can use this type of information. Uh, and you know, whereas before it may have been competitively useless uh, to companies, now you know, not so much. Um, in a lot of these markets. Um, and so, you know, in these, in these circumstances, uh, it's even the case that in large decentralized markets where um, it would have previously been, you know, maybe not impossible, but highly unlikely for competitors to get together to, uh, to agree or collude on prices, we're now having to criminally investigate um, those markets because of essentially the widespread use of algorithms that make it easier for you know, lots of competitors and all these different markets to come together, essentially, um, to, you know, what can be deemed uh, collude on, on prices. So, you know, I think in terms of, you know, advice for, for companies, you know, we're, we're seeing that smaller companies uh, who may not previously had, um, had emphasized or uh, put focus on, on antitrust compliance uh, in their rules, um, you know, even interna international companies that may be subject to to U.S. antitrust jurisdiction under the FTIA, um, I think that those companies should uh, should consider maybe the calculus changing um, because of the widespread use of algorithms in this space. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Let me turn now to uh, uh, Martin Peter, and I don't have a question for you, so I'll ask you to react. You've been uh, one of those more uh, cautious voices in the literature about some of these risks that you heard from Ryan and, and uh, from Michal. Uh, about especially the risk of coordination, but is, 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 give, us, give us your sense about, uh, 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 about the risk of coordination, we also think a little bit wider to moving in a world where the AI is very dominant. I mean, uh, is that changes uh, the, the scenery. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me, Antonio, to this, uh, to this great event. Um, yes, indeed. So I've been looking at this from the cartel perspective, and, and don't get me wrong, I am willing and able to see cartels uh, left and right, uh, but I have been a bit critical of the, of the literature on, um, on, on algorithmic collusion. Now, I applaud you for, for making this, and I know you've done a whole lot of work uh, with OECD on this topic. I, I applaud you for widening the scope now, and I, I fully agree with what Miguel said, and also the direction in which some of the enforcement is uh, developing that maybe we should talk about more about monopolization strategies, even more than exploitation of market power, which was on your slide. I think monopolization or exclusionary attempts uh, to try to obtain market power or abuse your market power by keeping it. That those are the strategies where these, uh, these algorithmic uh, issues are, are most uh, frightful. But for some reason, and that is my first uh, prepared uh, bit of talk and an answer to your question, um, a lot of the debate has focused on collusion. And there was this great scare that started with, uh, beautifully, I think, this Harvard Business book by, uh, press book by, by Ariel Azrachi and Marie Stucker, I think, uh, that, um, that, that now we have firms using algorithms and, and they might autonomously uh, start finding higher prices. Uh, so, and then who are we going to blame? Because the, the companies have adopted this this algorithm, but the algorithm is doing the collusion. So what can you do to an algorithm? You cannot put it in prison, you, can, you cannot fine it. The worst you can do to an algorithm, this was seriously debated at conference at the time, you can delete it. 
Uh, um, and, and then their algorithm maybe, maybe care. So it, it's important, I think, to see that the academic literature has, uh, how the academic, or sort of where the academic literature on this stands. And the point, of course, is algorithms, as you pointed out, have been around forever. When I was a child, I programmed BASIC on my Commodore 64, my children, Raspberry Pis, right? So algorithms are great, and they are around us, and we are benefiting from them greatly. The scare was with the, I think, the autonomous part. And that's also where the artificial intelligence, uh, the deep and machine learning, and, and, and certainly when we're talking about abuse later, um, dominant firms, the information delta problem comes in. So once you're ahead, you have the better information set, now you're using these, these deep learning uh, uh, artificial intelligence methods, now you might, you might uh, go ahead and, and leave the competition behind in ways that we would, that we would call anti-competitive, anti like through predatory or exclusionary behavior, other exclusionary behaviors. But when we look at the literature on autonomous collusion, really, we have to be careful. And so I want to make that warning. I think the challenge is still out there. So there is some literature. There's an AR paper by Calvano and others that's lots, lots cited that competition authorities are excited about. Um, there is also a paper by, uh, by Klein in the RAND uh, journal. So there's some papers that argue that very simple forms, but pretty theoretical, so not very practical in the sense that actually of actually used algorithms, but the pretty theoretical Q learning type of algorithms might find higher prices uh, when you let them run forever. And actually, and it's important when you sort of set them up to this. And it's, it's very important to recognize, I think, of this literature that uh, that, 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 that scare is a little bit uh, overblown. Yeah, so so what, these, what essentially these, these algorithms do is they, they find higher prices, but it's questionable, and you chose your words correct, uh, quite carefully already, it's quite questionable whether you could, you could actually call this collusion. And they tend to only find these higher prices when they are pretty much the same. So these companies use the same algorithm, almost like a carbon copy. They're synchronized. They are, uh, they are and importantly, they are, the companies are committed to uh, sort of outsourcing their prices through these algorithms. So it's not that in a couple of years from now when the prices have, found, have turned out to be high and the algorithms typically have a form of sort of stopping to experiment at some point so that they converge to higher prices. It's not that then somebody wakes up and says, well, uh, we've been using this algorithm. Maybe I should just manually undercut my rival Epsilon. Yeah, so there's a commitment here, very much a commitment to the algorithm, to keep using the algorithm forever. And, and, and that's not, so, so in a way, this kind of commitment and the coordination of the, of the algorithms presumes a, a kind of pre-game level of coordination that, that I would say we're back to classic, to classic collusion and also back to the classic cartel stability problem. It's, it's a little bit like, uh, like Adam Smith, right? So, so people of the, of the same trade seldom meet together or the conversation ends in a conspiracy to use the same uh, pricing algorithm. And, and so that's also where I think we can, we can, focus, we can focus our competition uh, law attention. Uh, so there would be maybe uh, a need for, but we can talk more about enforcement in the second block or the third block, but there would maybe be a need for the ability of competition authorities to look under the hood of what kind of pricing algorithms are actually used by companies and then check if they are very much the same, or if they are maybe purchased from the same uh, vendor, right? Like a hub and spoke type of setup, where there's one software company that supplies the software. There's been no case like that in other parts, uh, um, spare other parts, right? Where there's one vendor that sells the software, and then there's also these kinds of information links where the pricing is essentially pretty much coordinated in in a way that that we would probably uh, also could call a, a classic cartel. So I want to warn for that, 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 that uh, challenge for autonomous collusion that, that caused this great scare and where many competition authorities, I think, have spent quite a lot of resources, where maybe also some legislation and, 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 and so on is, is developing, we should be careful that that might have been a bit, a bit overblown. Yeah? For example, there's a, a recent paper, a CPI had a blog on it, a recent paper by Janine Tal and Catherine Tucker that argues exactly the opposite, that argues well, this kind of learning that leads to better demand estimation, uh, it actually it makes defection more attractive. And of course, there's the argument, 
this lightning speed uh, information exchange between those algorithms makes that if one algorithm starts deviating a little bit, so it tries to increase profits by sort of undercutting, then it will quickly be found out, and therefore it's not going to be very, uh, so quickly be left, lightning fast being found out that it's not going to be profitable, and so the faction is not going to be terribly attractive. But at the same time, apart from this insight from, 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 from Tucker and, and Tal, there's also, we should also realize that buyers use these algorithms as well. That goes a bit to uh, what Miguel already said. Uh, buyers use these algorithms as well. So they also will be quicker in figuring out that one of the finding out that one of the companies is actually offering a better deal, which means that you get a faster sales, which means that the deviation is, is attractive again. So this is like a cat and mouse game, if you like, that's not unlike what we had before, um, what we have always had. But now with a little bit more sophistication, but we had it when the telephone was introduced, collusion changed. Now we have it with the algorithms being introduced, collusion changed. I would think that, except for maybe under the hood looking, um, we can deal with this under the regular uh, competition law. Now, one final comment maybe, if I may, on where I do. So not the scares, not so much. I'm not so concerned about that cartel domain, because there's also sophistication with rivals, with entry. There's also sophistication with the agencies and with sellers, other sellers, and and certainly also uh, with buyers. The concern seems more in the abuse domain, and so that's great that we are moving in that direction now uh, with, the, with the panel. And, and indeed, as uh, Miguel pointed out, of course you can say these algorithms will be able, uh, certainly when there's a big platform that operates an algorithm with, a, with a information delta, so with better information, it will now be able to price discriminate and some of the Google economists have said, well, that's great because price discrimination is actually better than a uniform ignorant monopoly price, right? And so it actually increases welfare because everybody gets his willingness to pay to pay. Then uh, the sur total surplus, we get the total consumer surplus. Yeah, it becomes profit. So it goes to the firms, but that's a fairness matter. That's not, that is not an efficiency matter. So that's actually efficient. But of course, it's unfair, um, but maybe that's not for economists. Of course, the point is that competition, so that exclusionary or let's say, insulating matters, me mechanisms can start developing with these algorithms. So if there's a dominant company that has the good information and has the algorithm and it does this type of price discrimination to essentially take the critical buyers off the market, uh, then that is going to be a way of holding on to the market power, of preventing from entrants from coming in. And it may be an Uber example, which is already quite sophisticated, but it might also play in your local supermarket. Uh, so, so Paul Krugman already taught us at MIT, you should live in a neighborhood where people have time to shop and are not so wealthy. Because those people will go to the supermarket and they will put pressure on the prices, the prices will stay low, and then you come, you have no time, and you have high income, you come, you also pay the low prices. But what if the supermarket knows my willingness, sees that I'm a yuppie, I come in, and now it's, you know, there's, there's digital price tags now the prices start to change, right? So now the supermarket can offer low prices to the, to the shoppers. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a version of what you said. Uh, low prices to the shoppers, high prices to the non-shoppers is going to be very difficult for another supermarket to enter because the shoppers will not move to the other supermarket because they already get a good deal, whereas the, the supermarket can still exploit me. And so that it's actually preventing entry from a second supermarket next door because the uniform pricing rule, which is our classic rule for competition, is broken. So here, uh, and then I'll stop, but here the algorithms have a potential of essentially undermining the positive externality that the competitive process generates for everybody in the form of low prices. We only need a critical group of shoppers. Those shoppers are being insulated. And that's a very scary uh, development. I would be concerned there, where there's already abuse, or there, where there's already dominance, rather than where there's potential for competition, which is the domain, uh, the cartel domain I talked about first. Let me stop well, there. Sorry for going out. No, thanks a lot for putting a number of very interesting uh, uh, points on, uh, on the table. And before I give maybe a chance to Michal and, and Ryan to react, we can launch the second um, uh, poll question that will introduce us to the second part of the, of the panel discussion. And as you can see, it's now on, on screen. Assuming that uh, uh, algorithms uh, pose risk for competition, what governments can do, what is the answer, the most effective uh, response to those concerns, and you can see we've also, again, have polarized answers on the one hand, more enforcement, is antitrust a response, or do we need other tools of so regulatory intervention might be needed uh, to adapt the current legal framework to algorithmic competition, or an intermediary answer. You know, we heard this, this morning Professor Monti saying, 
no need to do anything, the market will fix it, no need to, for governments to worry about this too much. So let us know what you think, and then we'll, we'll uh, see the results and see what our panel, uh, whether our panel agrees with your, uh, with your views. But maybe Michal or Ryan want to react to some of the thought that um, uh, Martin Peter put on the table. Michal. <coughs> sure. Um, three, um, three points. Uh, first is um, in a recent paper that I uh, wrote with Dan Rubenfeld, we tried to scan all the competition uh, cases from around the world uh, with regard to um, that, that involved algorithms. And what we found, and this is Ryan to your point, is that we found that a lot of the uh, cases involved around what you might call hub and spoke cartels, okay, or hub and spoke agreements, where the, uh, the competitors use the same algorithm for pricing. And I think that we're going to see more and more of these. These are, in a way, or in a sense, these are the easier cases, much easier, uh, sorry, from a policy perspective, than the cases of, um, of algorithmic um, coordination that uh, Martin Peter uh, was talking about. Um, and when we treat them, I think that, um, again, we have to um, uh, make sure that our laws are fit for purpose here. And it's interesting that the, uh, the, the, that the U.S., um, some of the senators have um, introduced a bill. Um, it's called the um, Preventing Algorithmic Collusion Act. And it creates a, um, it creates a, a presumption of price-fixing agreements where direct competitors share competitively sensitive information through a pricing algorithm. And to my mind, when I read this, I say, you don't necessarily need that. We're already there. If competitors share uh, sensitive, uh, um, competitive, uh, competitive information, that by itself is prohibited by law. Um, second point is that uh, there are many models of algorithmic uh, uh, coordination. And uh, there is uh, a really interesting and very relevant debate in the literature with regard to how and when they can get to coordinated prices or to high super competitive prices. And Martin Peter has written a very interesting paper and Calvano has written and et al have written a, a, a very interesting paper. And the way that I understand it, and I hope that, Martin Peter, you, you agree with me, is that these papers focus on the process, whether the process is one of collusion in the economic sense uh, or not. However, I think that there is agreement that regardless of the process, at least some of the algorithms, the outcome of their use might be super competitive prices. So it might be a result of a coordination. It might be a result of, co uh, of collusion. It might be a result of simply reacting every time, again, again and again, to market uh, uh, conditions, even if this is, for example, a, an algorithm which does not have a memory. Now, it, of course, has relevance to the issue of whether this is captured under the term agreement. But even if a lot of these are not captured and they're not collusion, then the question becomes, from a policy perspective, do we want to prohibit them if algorithms can create super competitive prices, even if they're not engaged in agreements? Second point. Third point. There's a very interesting uh, uh, study by Assad and others who have studied the German gasoline market. And what they did, this is um, a real world, uh, a real world experiment where um, uh, uh, ga gas stations started using algorithms for pricing decisions. So they had the data before the use of the algorithms and they had the data after the use of the algorithms. And they checked markets in which they had the, the, uh, mar duopoly markets, in which there were two gas stations competing in a certain area. And what they found is where, uh, is where only one of the uh, firms used an algorithm, the price did not change. But when both firms 
used an algorithm, prices rose by 9 to 28 percent. Now, you might call it an agreement, or you might call it, you might say that it's not an agreement. I think that one of the challenges for the future, not only for the current uh, um, uh, challenges, is to ask um, whether competition law should deal with these cases, and if so, then how? So I can, I can speak to, I can't speak on any pending legislation, but I can speak to the, um, the fit for purpose, you know, and I'm sure that many of my, my colleagues uh, at other uh, global competition agencies would agree, would agree with this. We've heard this argument before. You know, we're not a taxi company, we're a tech company. You know, we're not a hotel company, we're a tech company. Um, and then these statements are, are inevitably followed by claims that the current antitrust laws or the regulations couldn't possibly apply to them because this is such new technology. Um, and you know, as with those companies, uh, simply because the algorithms are a new technology, it does not insulate them from the antitrust laws, um, particularly under uh, you know, what uh, Mikhail just was talking about, which is a, you know, generally a, a hub and spoke conspiracy. Um, and again, you know, I, think, I, th I think you touched on this. One way to think about algorithms is just, you know, they are a form of communication among competitors in that sense. Um, and I think for, for me, being a criminal antitrust enforcer, um, the easiest way to simplify it, and if I were to you know, have to go in front of a jury one day and argue this in a criminal trial, I think it's easy to imagine, you know, imagine what a human, um, if a human was doing this, um, or doing what the computer was doing, uh, and if the answer, again, um, as my colleagues were saying before, is that a human can't do this, then an algorithm can't do it either. Um, because again, at the end of the day, the humans, we're the ones coding the algorithms in the first place and teaching them. And um, you know, I think in that sense, a lot of the criminal cases in this space that we end up investigating and prosecuting um, could turn on the intent and the knowledge of the parties, both building the algorithm and intending to use the algorithm. Um, so it's gonna be questions like, you know, does this involve um, competitors using, using al an algorithm as the means and methods of colluding? Um, or are they using the algorithms to implement an agreed upon price, either, again, through explicit or implicit terms? Is there an invitation to collude that inherently contemplates concerted action? Do the competitors know that their competitors are going to be using this? Is that, is that an aspect that causes them to, to want to use it, to want to take advantage of the competitively sensitive data that their, their competitors are providing to the algorithm? Um, so again, I think, it's, I think in, in that sense, algorithms are just another, another way in a long line of, of different ways of communicating. You know, we had faxes uh, back in the day. I, <laughs> and we, you know, we had the, the great uh, days of email where uh, a lot of people didn't realize that uh, deleting an email didn't actually delete it. And so we got a lot of indications that people were colluding um, via email back in those days. And then we had text messages and uh, encrypted messenger apps. So again, I think, I think you know, algorithms do fall in that category and they may be more sophisticated and more complex and it, there may be a greater risk of, of uh, the algorithms being able to make practical use of data that, that might not previously have been used for anti-competitive purpose. But um, you know, I, I think one other aspect of of this from the section one enforcement context is that algorithms in a sense are going to make our prosecution stronger because you know they leave a digital trail we can get the code we can analyze the code we can see what happened we can see how the algorithm worked and what it did i think most of the time anyway and that kind of evidence is is invaluable you know memories at least my memory uh is not infallible um but you know the, the evidence that's left by a computer, a digital trail, you know, that, that's evidence that will stand up in court um, a lot of times. And you know, I think another, another key point uh, in building these cases under the current law is, is you know, we're, we're mindful some of our, our recent criminal trial, we've, we've been using more um, uh, covert methods of investigation, if you will, in these cases, um, wiretaps, um, consensual recordings, of individuals to really flesh out on the front end what the intent of individuals are in using these, these algorithms um, to really make sure that we have that intent element squared away uh, at the initial stages of our, of our investigation so we know whether it's worth pursuing. 
So since you have the microphone, let me ask you the next uh, natural questions, and you are the enforcer on the panel. Is this you know, an area with, you know, where algorithms and AI are developing where we should expect more enforcement uh, going forward from you know, agencies around the world? Uh, and again, I can't talk about specific cases, but uh, I mean, what I can say is our AAG has been very explicit. This is a, uh, an important area uh, of emphasis for, for the Department of Justice. Um, and you know, we're gonna be, we are going to be scrutinizing um, these types of cases, both in, in, you know, from a criminal perspective um, and otherwise. Um, you know, I, think, I think one example that I can give that's just a, a practical um, analogy, you know, I think under our, our views, it would be per se unlawful. Let's say if a, a software company made a series of invitations to competing widget makers uh, to use its, its price, pricing algorithm. Um, in that invitation, it made clear to the widget makers uh, that the software company intended to sign up all of its competitor widget makers um, because the effectiveness of the algorithm to increase revenues depended in part on other widget makers joining, as, as my colleague was just, just describing. Um, and then the widget maker signed up to use the algorithm, with the algorithm with the understanding that their competitors were doing the same thing. Um, so again, it makes no difference in this situation uh, that the price fixing is implemented via joint use of an algorithm instead of via an express agreement on the charge price. Um, price fixing by, and this is a quote from a, a, one of our cases, express delegation, acquiescence, or understanding um, is also per se illegal under our, our case law. So I think you know, those are the situations that we're going to be looking at very closely and, and scrutinizing. Um, and beyond that, you'll just have to stay tuned. <laughs> Yeah, so Ryan, for someone who cannot comment on cases and also not on pending law, you're saying a whole lot of things. So that's that's great. It's very insightful. Um, so, so to Miguel first, uh, you, you you asked, isn't the issue about uh, whether there is an agreement? I think the the point the point is that there is a pre-game agreement in a way. So in these papers that are out there that have been so scary, there is a form of coordination already in built in, essentially, that's not talked about. So everybody uses the Q-learning, everybody uses the same uh, you know, support for the learning, so the same type of prices are being uh, uh, considered by the algorithms and so on. So that's synchronization, as I mentioned. So there's a, and a commitment issue. So there is a level of uh, agreement there. That said, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to you, uh, Ryan, it's not that these algorithms have joint profit maximization, for example, uh, build in them. Uh, so it's not that you can easily open them up and see, oh, wait a minute, uh, they're calling each other up uh, and they're jointly profit max they're doing joint profit maximization. They're not calling each other up. They're, they're going over the internet. They're figuring out the prices that are public information that are posted by their rivals, which is always, uh, or well, yeah, rivals or, or co-conspirators co then, depending on uh, what we're looking at. But they're looking at the prices that are out there in the public domain Right? They, they, they do use sophisticated, uh, for example, stock algorithms so that, they can so that they can figure out what the sales may have been. Right? And, and it's not so hocus pocus that's going on. There's, there, companies are using these things. Uber was mentioned many things. But of course, uh, airline companies have been using this kind of stuff forever, right? For their booking uh, systems. And it's not that we have such collusive uh, airline uh, cases or prices, uh, uh, probably. So, so actually, really, a question to you I would have is, I'm a little concerned about that type of legislation. It sounds good. I'm afraid it serves a little bit on the initial scare of autonomous uh, collusion. And I've seen Harvard Business Review papers, for example, that, that talk about um, advice to managers not to use certain algorithms because there might be these antitrust liabilities. So if, if we don't fully understand what is collusive and what's not, and again, many in the literature are collusive, so it's a, a Q-learning thing. You could even think of as, an it's also an algorithm, an agreement where you say, I'm always going to put your price. You, you could say that's also an algorithm, or we're, all, we're both going to put 10. Yeah, that, that's also an algorithm, and that certainly uh, looks, looks very collusive. But it looks more sophisticated in the papers, but it's not that obvious, I think, at the same time, uh, that, that once you look at it, that there has been this pre-stage where there has been this agreement. So I was wondering if you can comment on it, uh, if you, if you, how you're going to distinguish uh, between that, how that works in, in practice so that you do not over-enforce and scare companies away from using uh, perfectly benign and socially beneficial 
uh, algorithms that are generating all sorts of good, right? As you, as Antonio mentioned, is, is very likely to be the case. Yeah, so I, not I, the over enforcement, but the good things. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think two things. One, I, I do think there there may have been a case back in the day about airlines using an algorithm that was. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm I'm just hearkening back to uh, to I think 2006 maybe. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I think I think generally it's going to come down to you know what. What I was talking about before. What's the intent, and and what's, you know, what is the intent of using the algorithm? What does it do? Are there other reasons for using it other than raising prices? I think all of that is going to play into the analysis um, going forward. Because again, again, we, you know, we we criminally prosecute um, price fixing and market allocations. It is you know it is fairly narrow in that sense. Um, and you know when when you look at the conduct and when you look at you know what the purpose of it is. Is it is the purpose of it to raise prices? Is that the the essential the the meat of the agreement? Um, you know, and I, again, I think that's what it'll come down to. But it's just like any other cases, just like cases in 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 traditional markets where there is no algorithm. You know, what is the purpose of the agreement? Is it to fix prices or is it to you know do something else that may have pro competitive benefits? And you know I think again I don't think it, it really necessarily changes. And I do think the algorithms may make that easier in the sense that we will be able to get a better sense of what the purpose is by looking at the algorithm. What's it doing? What's the purpose? Maybe not necessarily. You know we won't necessarily see those direct communications, or maybe we will. Maybe they do have them. We don't know. <laughs> we'll have to see. <laughs> Michal, maybe uh, your views on this question about enforcement, yes, or enforcement, no, or when and how, but maybe to expand the, 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 the question, uh, if enforcement is, is not the only response that governments can do, are there other ways to deal with these concerns? And we've seen regulation developing for, for platforms. Is this an area where we'll see more regulation, ex ante regulation, or there are other ways? I mean, you talk about consumers, uh, algorithmic uh, use. Is there other ways to deal with some of these concerns beyond enforcement? <coughs> Um, thank you, Antonio. Just uh, before, um, if I can say um, a word about the fact that um, uh, of whether or not competition authorities uh, are going to um, probably need to deal with the, more of these cases in the future, I think that the answer is definitely yes. And I think it's not only the number. I think that competition authorities would have to uh, also require what I might call institutional agility because you actually need to, to create some internal changes within the competition authority. One of the things that you might need is a data unit with the competition, uh, uh, sorry, with a, um, uh, um, uh, uh, data scientists and computer scientists that can actually uh, um, understand how these markets op are operating in order to use or maybe use even algorithms uh, based on you know the new field of antitrust uh, which is called computational antitrust which uses um, algorithms in order to predict um, in order to uh, evaluate in order to illuminate all kinds of uh, remedies and so we're seeing this around the world the CMA has a big data unit now other competition authorities uh, 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 are creating such units I think we're going to see more and more of that and another change which is related to it is the information because up until now we did not require information about the data and algorithms uh, which are used in the platforms um, unless there was a specific uh, uh, case. And, and now I think that this type of information is going to be more and more important and we actually need uh, people who can deal with it. Now, to your really important question with regard to how do we deal with uh, some of these issues. Now, in my uh, most recent paper, I applied decision theory, uh, which I found to be extremely um, useful here. And I separate some different cases um, uh, where competition can apply or it cannot apply, where it's sufficient or it's insufficient. So let me um, give you several scenarios. So the first is where dealing with algorithms does not require changes in, in the law. Actually, the law is, uh, um, is, um, is uh, sufficiently uh, efficient in the sense, and algorithms do not change the analysis. Think about 
uh, market power, or the way that we define market power shouldn't change just because firms are using more um, algorithms. However, even in this category, we should be more attuned to the effects of algorithms. Um, and um, one example is the hub and spoke uh, agreements that Ryan was uh, mentioning and um, I mentioned before. And some of the questions that we are going to ask with regard to such agreements might need to be attuned to how these algorithms actually affect markets. So let me give you just two examples. One is one that Ryan already mentioned, is the use of historical or historic data, okay? Because an algorithm can learn from historic data and predict the next move. And once we take that into account, maybe we should be more careful when they share such historic uh, data. The second is that um, there was a really interesting uh, um, investigation into a firm called uh, RealPage, which had an algorithm, uh, um, uh, which operated an algorithm that set prices, rental prices. And what the uh, um, investigation showed is that uh, renters uh, were more likely to raise the price significantly when an algorithm suggested it rather than a human suggested it because they relied more on the algorithm uh, um, to be correct. And so the prices rose more than they would if a human would have suggested that to them. So this is the first uh, type of, uh, of uh, cases. The second are cases in which the algorithms uh, do not change the law, but rather they need a change in perception when we apply the law. And I think a very good example is, uh, is uh, um, the size of the relevant market. Because as I mentioned before, algorithms can um, better calculate willingness to pay, at least of uh, uh, some consumers and to more precisely separate uh, consumers or consumer uh, groups. And they can then uh, have more market power in niche markets, what, I'll, uh, what economists call monopolistic competition. And if this is the case, and uh, 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 previous um, um, FTC Commissioner Varney has made this point in one of her papers, um, if this is the case, then we all need to think a bit differently about the size of the market in which a firm might be able to raise its prices significantly. The third uh, 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 group of cases that I want to suggest to you are those in which algori algorithms strengthen the need uh, for stricter uh, requirement because sometimes the economic assumptions on which our laws are based are insufficient to deal with algorithms. Just think about the case of predation that I talked about before using the uh, uh, example of, uh, of um, the um, algorithm called Hell that um, uh, Uber used. Um, and, and, and I think that in, in many of the cases, uh, of these cases, what the algorithms do, the introduction of algorithms do, is it, it, they increase false positives. So they increase those cases in which otherwise we would have assumed that the conduct does not significantly affect competition. And so I would, I, I, I hope that um, more economists are going to invest more time in separating out uh, uh, these cases. The fourth group are cases in which we might need a, a new prohibition. And that might be the case of price discrimination because if many more firms use pricing algorithms in order to discriminate and so that, uh, and, and our models currently focus on the effect of discrimination in one market at a time, but if many firms are able to price discriminate with regard to the same consumer in different markets, then the aggregate effect of such discrimination might be different than the, uh, when we look at uh, each market uh, separately, disregarding the effects of discrimination or its externalities on other markets. 
And, uh, uh, and, and uh, um, uh, finally, the, the last group here that I want to mention are cases on which we need alternative indicators. And I think a good example here are cases in which uh, uh, competition authorities focus on homogeneity or heterogeneity um, of products or costs in markets. And the more heterogeneous they are, the less you assume that uh, coordination will take place. But if the algorithms are sufficiently sophisticated to overcome these kinds of analysis, then maybe you should change some of your assumption. Last word here, algorithmic consumers. Okay, uh, we talked about algorithms used by suppliers. Algorithms can also be used by consumers, unfortunately. And you know, uh, I, I have a lot to say about that, but yeah, I don't have time. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, barriers to such algorithms, but I hope that competition authorities are going to take this seriously and uh, uh, limit some of these barriers because uh, consumers should not necessarily sit, sit like sitting ducks and wait for suppliers to increase the prices. You can actually use algorithmic consumers in order to create buyer power, in order to create a buffer uh, uh, with regard to your data. Uh, um, the algorithm can be a buffer there. They can reduce costs, they can create more sophistication, and they create a, a new player in the game. Thank you, and I know M uh, Martin Peter wants to react, but uh, let me ask yeah. the last question, and you can react to this discussion as well. It's on AI. It's the last point I wanted to touch, especially with you, because you mentioned it in your opening. And I wonder, because the discussion is moving now towards uh, the impact of AI on markets. Many at OECD are working on AI. I see many colleagues here from other parts of the OECD who are involved uh, with that work. The competition committee has already agreed to have a session in June on AI. So you think that these developments are more of a threat to markets or an opportunity? Do you see the future as the matrix or as a minority report? There are a lot of opportunities for the use of AI. What's, uh, yeah. what's your favorite film? I had the matrix actually in my notes, but I didn't uh, mention it so far, so I'm glad for you to b that you bring it up. But I first wanted to say, of course, uh, to, uh, to the long uh, uh, speech that Miguel gave, she knows so much about this, and so I absolutely recommend that you read her paper with Dan uh, Rubenfeld in the Antitrust Law Journal. It just came out, right? This it yes. just came out. Tomorrow. It's very thick. They always are very thick in that journal, obviously, but this one is uh, very, very rich, so, so have a look. Um, I, I have a few uh, quick uh, comments uh, to this. So. The historic data, I'm not so sure if that will be the dimension where we should pull the line because, uh, or draw the line. Because I, if I understand you, you would be a bit wary if algorithms use historic data. But, but of course, that's also where the learning about the better assessment of where the demand is and so on is. Mm -hmm. and, and so that would tie directly into the paper I mentioned already uh, that shows that, uh, by, by Talan Tucker, that shows that if you have better information, a better assessment of where the demand is, that actually destabilizes collusion. So, and, and I can think of other ways in which historical data is very, very useful. Um, so, so I would be a bit careful there. I would, I would rather think, um, and that goes maybe also to the identification of suspicious algorithms, the commitment part is really important. Uh, so the fact that the parties commit to outsourcing uh, their pricing decisions to that algorithm, and, and they don't revise, so they're not going to the, uh, they somehow commit. How they exactly do that is an open question, but it's assumed in these models, and maybe in reality it's happening, that they somehow tie their hands to the mast uh, uh, and say, well, we're, we're leaving the algorithm do our pricing. And so that means that they def effectively give up their defection probability of possibilities, and that will, be, that will make things collusive. But, but that said, I think it's hugely important that the competition authorities develop uh, tech skills. Uh, so so I'm, uh, th you really need to understand need to understand these algorithms very, very deeply, I think. And at the moment, it's not even all that clear uh, that you can even look at them, I think. And then certainly uh, how to understand them uh, seems, seems, to be, seems to be quite an issue. Um, now, your, your question, but, but really what I wanted to go back to, because we're now we're talking a whole lot about collusion again, I think the real question is how are we going to move to banning uh, exclusion by algorithm? Uh, so abuse of dominance or monopolization, uh, exclude. So, so here, l let me first say something about AI. I can be quick. Yeah, uh, that's what you'll say in mind. 
So, so I don't think that that is a whole lot different. Okay, so, so uh, whether we're talking uh, algorithms, AI, big data, uh, deep learning, uh, those are more sophisticated forms, but conceptually, I'm not so alarmed. Uh, so there's some people who say that this is really different because this is artificial intelligence, and that's what we used to be, intelligent. And now when you mentioned the matrix, we're going to be in the matrix, and somebody is going to take power, right? Well, we'll take, somebody will take the pill. I'm not, I forgot which color is the right one. Uh, figure it out and then solve the problem, I suppose, maybe in the sequel. Uh, huh? You don't believe in it? <laughs> and we have Terminator 2, exactly. which is also. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm not so sure. I think we shouldn't create a new scare here uh, with this. This is great technology. Uh, we can benefit a lot, but we should keep our competition laws straight. And, and so we can look for, under the hood for maybe there's a collusive intent. Um, and I was wondering, but that's really a question because I'm just a simple economist, would it be possible to prosecute a theory of harm where you say these firms have been using price discrimination, a dominant firm has been using price discrimination as an exclusionary or some sort of monopolization strategy, an exclusionary strategy to, to, uh, to keep entrance out? Would that be, is, so how would you envision this? Is this like um, we're going to prohibit price discrimination? You have to use a uniform price? Yeah? That's one of one of the problems. Yeah. yeah. So, but how do you see that? Because that, that seems a really invasive. So we've always <laughs> thought about price discrimination as a bit of an odd one, right? An odd one out, unless it is between sellers and. Uh, but 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 price discrimination is is not really in our domain. But now it would come into the domain. So can you explain how that would work in this? Thirty seconds. Oh. Michael. <laughs> I'm leaving this to the yeah. economist. What I'm saying is that. Uh, the introduction of uh, algorithms creates new challenges, and we have to think about them. We cannot simply uh, continue with our old models. Um, it would not necessarily lead to a change. It might be that we would still not uh, prohibit price discrimination, but we need to think about it. We cannot use our old assumptions. Mm -hmm. And with regard to historic data, I completely agree with you. I, my own take on that is that we need a quick look here, there. It's not a complete prohibition, but we need a, com uh, a quick look on what's happening. Okay, we, we are really close to the end of the panel, but I wanted to take a question or two. But before we do that, maybe Becky can upload the results of the poll, so we'll see what the audience thinks about some of the issues that we've been discussing here. So the first question was, are you concerned with algorithms? Do they pose a risk? And it's really a 50-50. Uh, uh, some, some, you know, 40, 46% sees that uh, there are risks, or risks are significant. Uh, or the risk may exist, uh, but the unbalance, maybe uh, the pro-competitive uh, effects are outweigh the, um, uh, the anti-competitive. And on the second question, uh, this, what this to do is, about this it? Is, this is still quite a bit the scare. Huh? Yes, there is a lot of the, the scare. Well, a lot yeah. of people have watched The Terminator. <laughs> 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 Let, let's see on the solutions or the, the responses, uh, what, what the audience think. Again, it's a very mixed uh, uh, views or maybe 50-50, close to 50-50, more enforcement would be effective, uh, and uh, almost 50% thinks that we need more rules and some regulatory intervention in this, in this area. So we'll, we'll comment on this on the coffee break, but I would like to take a question or two from, from the audience. There is a question here. Uh, please introduce yourself before asking the question and to the panel or to one of the panelists. There's a gentleman here. Yeah, thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, it's Daniel. Um, 10 or 15 years ago, I think it was uh, suitable to say that um, competition agencies were maybe more willing to risk under enforcement rather than over enforcement in digital markets. But if we, we bring this to today in relation to AI, uh, do you think that competition agencies are now more willing to risk over enforcement rather than under enforcement? And to be clear, I'm not referencing any, any cases, but rather um, for example, uh, reports issued by competition agencies over the last year or so. I mean, there seems to be a narrative that um, we are uh, ready to take action if necessary, and I don't remember seeing this in early stages of digital, digital platforms. So it seems to be a bit more of a willing to over-enforce. So that's basically my question. Thank you. So I can address that. So I, actually, this dovetails well with, uh, I need, just need to correct, the airline case that I was talking about was actually from 1994. Um, and actually, so this 
goes to your point. I think, I think enforcement agencies have always been very concerned about this. The case that the airline case that I was referencing is a case uh, that the Department of Justice pursued in 1994, and it related to um, uh, a computerized fare information system owned by the, uh, the domestic airlines in the United States um, called the Airline Tariff Publishing Company, or ATP. Um, and you know, they, it, it was a similar concern to, you know, to, to what we're talking about today. So I think in this area, um, I'm not necessarily sure that it's an issue of under enforcement or over enforcement. I think it's an issue of, you know, really identifying, identifying the the risk of um, companies using this technology inappropriately to commit, you know, when in the United States would be crimes. Um, and I think the risks are are there, um, very and they're very real. And so, I, you know. It, in that sense, I don't necessarily think, again, it's over enforcement. We always follow you know, what we call the justice manual uh, in deciding whether or not to open and pursue a criminal investigation. But, um, but I think this technology is making it just much easier um, for more companies to engage in this type of conduct than we've ever seen before, just because it, it bridges that, that gap of that, and it solves that, um, it solves the, uh, the collusion problem, essentially, when you're talking about like a large decentralized market where there's lots of different competitors across, you know, the country or the world, right? Now they can all come together, just like the internet brings everybody together, um, you know, whether that's positive or negative, but algorithms can bring uh, competitors together much easier. So I think that would be how I would um, answer the question. Thank you for the question. That was a great one. Let me see if there's a lot, one last question, and then we'll be... Can you know. comment on this? Let's see if there's one question. I see Dave in the back over there. Last question, and then you can, you know, maybe react uh, to this. Thanks, or Antonio, and thanks everybody. This is a great panel. I'm Dave Anderson. I'm a lawyer at Brian Cave in Brussels. Antonio, we had a seminar a couple years ago, and I think this debate was kicking off, and it was really about the scare um, uh, thing that we had going on. And I remember we talked. How's that? Uh, the agencies all around the world were trying to grapple with this, and we categorized them into the worried, uh, the wondering, and the what's the problem. There were three Ws, because people were all over the place. And I, I do think that agencies largely have, and, and we had discussions with lots of folks at ICN, have gotten over the scare problem, um, that it was you know, looking quite difficult. But I do take the monopolization question, but the thing I wanted to to ask Mikhail and, and maybe the panel generally is, would you really advise competition agents around the world to look at um, prohibitions or curbs on free pricing, price discrimination, and also looking at your competitors' prices? We want them to do that. We want competitors to know what everyone's doing in a free market, not crossing the line into collusion, but this is the essence of, uh, uh, of the information. We want them to react when somebody's going high. We want them to undercut. And I just wonder, is this something which we, we should be really asking agencies to do? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> that's a great example of exactly the point that I was making in the beginning, that the same, that the same algorithm can bring both benefits and costs. And, it's, uh, and, and the task is to um, balance them both so that algorithms um, can perform um, monitoring, and they can perform prediction, and they can perform um, uh, tasks like uh, uh, um, determining the price at every point of time with regard to every different consumer. Is that by itself bad? No. Are we going to prohibit algorithms or the use of algorithms before or because of that? Definitely not. No. no. What we are looking for, what we should seek, is uh, are those instances in which the algorithm is used in a way which creates much more harm than benefits. Now, are we going to be able to do that carefully in each and every one of the scenarios? Probably not. Like today, we would need all kinds of presumptions which are going to be based on our understanding of how algorithms affect different markets under different scenarios. That's exactly why we need the teams that are built, by, uh, built with data scientists and lawyers and economists together. Now, today, this kind of work 
has become more and more important. And I, th I think, and this also relates to Daniel's uh, uh, question, that for now, competition authorities should start with the low-hanging fruit. They should study the more, inter uh, more complicated cases, but there's some low-hanging fruit that you can already start dealing with, and they have already started with them in different jurisdictions around the world. The OECD has done a wonderful wor uh, work this uh, past June in trying to canvas these and uh, a wonderful panel that we had last uh, uh, June on that. Um, does that mean, again, does that mean we're going to prohibit price discrimination? Not necessarily, but we have to check whether our assumptions are correct. Does it mean that we're going to prohibit pricing algorithms? Definitely not. I really think, 30 seconds and then yeah. we need to close. Okay, so I'm fully with Miguel on the, it's very exciting to think about that domain. And I think we should absolutely move into the domain of abuse of dominance. Because to your question and, and also Ryan, to your answer, I, I was trying to make the point that it's not true that the algorithms solve the cartel problem, or as you said, the, coll the, the, the collusion problem. There's still the issue that there needs to be some coordination on what to calculate the prices with, right? And there's no honesty amongst thieves, also not amongst thieves with calculators. And so there's still the defection, uh, 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 the whole defection problem, the whole instability problem that undermines collusion. So I do fear a bit that, that, that if we do not build the capabilities in the agencies and the, and the focus is going to stay on collusion, that, that, that is going to lead to over-enforcement because there's too much care in the business community, that what will be genuine and great algorithms would be mistaken for some form of, of collusion. And so we, we really need to invest enforcement efforts uh, in skills there, I think. Well, thanks a lot. Sadly, we have to close this, this, this panel. We could have gone on. Um, there's a coffee break uh, waiting for you, shorter than planned. It's only 10 minutes now, so <laughs> please be back at quarter past four uh, for the next panel on uh, digital mergers and theories of harm. But before you do that, please help me with a, a big round of applause to thank the panelists. Thank you.